Well, good morning and thank you uh, for attending the 10th CITES conference. I'll do a little bit of an opening in a couple of minutes, but before I do, I'd just like to introduce you to our Pro Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Rob Campbell, who will do an introduction to the conference and a welcome to Bolton. Thank you. Oh, it does work. That's, that's gratifying. Technology usually lets me down. Um, the more astute amongst you will have noticed that I'm not the Vice Chancellor, I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor. George sends his apologies. Uh, he hasn't been able to, uh, he's been delayed, he's not able to get here on time. But uh, I'm, uh, in a way, I'm pleased about that because it gives me the opportunity to welcome you here to Bolton, particularly if uh, this is your first time. Um, and I hope you have a, a, a successful and enjoyable day. I'm sure the, uh, uh, that you will because the, the CITES conference is uh, uh, always an interesting and vibrant affair. Um, I, I've, I've been on the fringes of several now, and uh, the atmosphere is very, very good. Um, you can tell from the suit and tie that I'm management. Um, <laughs> but in another life, I was a philosopher. I suppose, in a way, I still am. Uh, and the, the, uh, the concepts and the ideas that you are uh, probing and examining uh, today are really, really interesting, and I, I wish I could stay to, to listen to more of it, but I'm going to stay for the first half hour or so and catch what I can. Uh, so, welcome again. I'm uh, very pleased to see you all here. I hope you have a, a, an enjoyable and a profitable uh, day, and I'm, I'm sure you will, and I'll pass you back to Paul. Uh, I think my first comment, it's, it's reassuring to see so many people here. Uh, this is the first occasion we've had to charge for attending this conference in uh, the 11 years that we've been doing it. And uh, I guess it's, uh, well, it's, it's certainly some justification that we are doing something right, that this community does wish to meet and get together and, and talk about some of the issues that we'll be raising. So I'm very, very pleased that you were able to attend. And for the record, uh, our conference fees were designed not to... Uh, make any kind of profit but just to cover the costs and uh, I think we're going to be able to do that this year so I'm very hopeful that we'll have another one next year for those that might want to come. And also something that I've observed this year is it's probably the first time I've really looked at the gender mix of the conference and um, in the 11 years, 12 years I've doing it, I think it used to be Lorna, Yvonne and Sue and one or two others. Now we've got a pretty good mix we're getting there so uh, I think for a technology conference, again, it's good to see uh, a little more diversity than perhaps we've had in the past, um, so that's good. I think the first thing to do is to give a big mention to uh, our sponsors uh, of the event, and the sponsors this year, the University of Bolton for hosting us and um, subsidising the conference, so I'm very pleased about that. Pebble Learning, um, Pebble Learning, uh, and I'll read you a little bit of Microsoft's style spiel, but uh, indulge me for a few moments, is a leading learning technology used in organisations across the globe to support learning, teaching, assessment, career advancement and professional development. Um, I don't know whether Shane's here yet. Is Shane here? No, I think, I think we're expecting Shane uh, of Pebble Learning uh, to come to the conference a little later. Our other sponsor is APS, um, probably better known to you as, as Alan Paul. And Allen is an information management company specialising in HE and FE sectors in the UK. Uh, I'd also <coughs> like to thank JISC, who for many, many years uh, provided support for this conference. And um, it was quite interesting. I was chatting to JISC colleagues last night. And um, my assumption was that we wouldn't get support for this year's conference. And I was told last night that if I'd have made a strong approach, we probably would have got some support. Uh, and that's a credit really to the delegates here and um, the opportunity that I think JISC have got to, to talk to its, its customers, its stakeholders. So um, uh, that, was, that was quite interesting for me. I missed, missed out on one there. And I'd, I'd like to also take a, a, the opportunity really, and I'll perhaps expand on this a little later, to thank all of my CITIS colleagues, that's everyone that I work with in CITIS, who for many years it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with colleagues who have so much knowledge, um, are so professional in, in, in what they do, and um, it's, it's, a it's, it's generally a pleasure to come and work. We do have our 
occasional disagreements, and they're heated. Um, but uh, I think as a family, we're, we're, we're pretty tight, and uh, again, it's a pleasure to work. When I talk about that, uh, I also include um, our former citizens, and, and perhaps I'll chat about that a little bit later. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was perhaps talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been involved with with IMS in um, specification development. Uh, last year, a colleague of mine, particularly Wilbert, uh, looked at various surveys and we looked into the use of technology standards across the sector. And I, I have to say, I was quite surprised. Uh, I mean, one of the issues we have in CITES is that if our spec work and our standards work is successful, it's unseen, it just works. There's an assumption that these things just happen. So again, um, learning technology, interoperability, capability, 73% um, of HE has that specification embedded within its system, 85 in FE. Uh, enterprise or, or LIS, 84% in HE, 70% in FE. QTI, 46% in HE, 20% in FE. And content packaging stroke common cartridge, 90% HE and 99% in FE. And those are quite astounding figures for the IMS spec. So quite often when I'm raised with a question, well, what are you doing in specific specifications? Are they used or, oh, it's a, a rather insular group of, of of, of individuals doing things that are not relevant. It, it couldn't be further from the truth. A lot of this is now embedded in practice. Certainly very, very different from a uh, different situation to when I first became involved um, 12, 13 years ago. Um, I think what I'd also like to do is tell you a little bit, uh, I'll, I'll do, a, if you give me five minutes of indulgence of self-promotion, uh, about CETIS, really. CETIS, as you know, was funded by JISC for many years and will continue to receive some funding from JISC, particularly to support our work in specs and standards. But we've had to diversify and this year we have taken on work for the commercial sector. Um, we've done quite a bit of work for one of the evil enemy, which I, I'm not going to mention. Uh, we've done uh, a number of European projects. Uh, currently we're working with um, Creative Commons on the Learning Resource Metadata Initiative, uh, working on a European project around learning analytics, a uh, community exchange project. And I am currently discussing with GIST colleagues what we might do with GISC over the next year. So for those that say, oh, are you still working with GISC? Absolutely still working with GISC. And I'm sure Phil will talk about some of the developments and changes that have occurred within GISC uh, during his presentation. Um, I'm also very pleased to read this statement to you, uh, which we're very proud of. Um, this is a statement from Andy Yule, and the statement is, subject coding is one of the key aspects of data and information in HE. The current system, JAX, was created in the late 90s through the merger of systems used by HESA and UCAS. The JAX system has its roots in the early 70s. I'm delighted to be able to announce that a team led by CETUS at the University of Bolton has been awarded the contract to develop a new subject coding system for the sector. In order to create a system that meets users' needs, the team will build a broad and rich picture of the requirements for subject coding from stakeholders across the information landscape. The creation of HEDIP is a huge opportunity to address some of the problems we have with data and information, coding structures that can be used by all data collectors and that provide the information we all need are a key element of the future we are working towards. Um, so we, we just made that announcement yesterday. I think it was on the HESA website yesterday and ours yesterday. So again, uh, a big congratulations to the team. And we've got some challenging work ahead over most of the part of this year in addressing some of those issues, we hope, with some of you. CETIS conference, as I said, it's been going for 11 years now. And we think it's a pretty unique opportunity for developers, learning technologists, lecturers and policy makers to come together to discuss innovation and innovations in the domain of education technology. This year's conference focuses on the digital institution and explores how technology innovation can support and develop every aspect of university and college life. 
for teachers, learners, researchers, developers, service directors, managers, and most significantly, for the benefit of our students. Look at your conference agenda for the sessions and times. I'm not, I'm not going to dwell on them now. I think you've all registered. There are some exciting sessions there. There'll be a lot of heated debate, and times uh, are available on your agenda. Any problems, again, see Bethan um, and the team down at the reception desk. We do value our networking time at the CITES conference as well. Uh, many of our delegates say it's a good opportunity to meet with colleagues, to share ideas, and a lot of projects have been born at CITES conferences over the last 10 years, so we actively encourage you to mingle, to take opportunity to meet new colleagues and to work on exciting new innovations collectively. As ever seems to be the case, the UK HE and FE sector is going through change. Um, institutions are in flux in many uh, instances and we continue to face enormous challenges around funding and around our stakeholder expectations, be they students, be they policy makers at government levels. We're being bombarded from all sides. And now that students are, and I, I will add this caveat, contentiously regarded as customers or consumers of education, my own belief is there's something else, um, but we, we'll go with that for the purpose of this talk. The, are there expectations of higher and further education changing? In all our activities within the sector, we encourage to involve students, the learner voice, in co-design of curriculum and on our governing bodies. I mean, you may not be aware that the only legal requirement, prescribed legal requirement, for members of a governing body of a further education institution is that there are, is a staff and a student representative. There are no other legal requirements. Theoretically, you could have a governing body of three. But do our students know best? Do they have the capacity to make meaningful contributions? That's a question, it's not really a statement. And I also accept that my presentation this morning will be full of contradiction. On the one hand, I'm saying that students do have the capacity, and on the other, I'm questioning that. Um, students as customers, uh, challenges. Now, um, it isn't a bit of self-plugging here, though it might appear it is. Uh, in my other life, my partner, we, we live in quite a nice country house, and we have a, and I, I use this uh, term, a five-star gold bed and breakfast. Um, at the high end of the market, we're number one on TripAdvisor or the region, and we are defined by our quality from our competition. That's my argument. I think we describe ourselves as very much a Russell Group bed and breakfast. <laughs> Don't quote that. Uh, our standards are defined externally and inspected by our own quality assurance agency. It's called Visit Britain. And customers often make their choices based on that QA report. Does it kind of sound familiar? With the advent of social media, our quality, our service and our experience is subject to the scrutiny of our customers through sites such as TripAdvisor. And yes, this will inevitably assume more significance to our sector as we become increasingly customer focused. And we recently received the following review. Um, I won't read all of it, but um, on our return from a great evening, we were startled to find that even though we had only had our route, left our room for about an hour due to the friendly welcome, our room had been entered. The curtains had been drawn with the cushions replaced neatly along the window and the chocolates being left on the pillows. I found this unsettling and would really prefer not to have anyone in our room once we had our keys. We shouldn't have to worry about what may be lying around. Now, excuse the metaphor, but now we're engaging on the peripheral end of student experience in my view. If we fluff up, fluff up our cushions and place the chocolates on our pillows for our students, how are they going to respond? Do they know what good quality is? And I think that is going to present us with some real challenges. JISC is doing some work from prospect to alumnus um, where customers will question their service. This year, the sector has received over 22,000 complaints, the most ever recorded, and the majority of which, I think it was about 80% when I did a quick review, relate to assessment grades. 
If I pay my £27,000, my expectation is I get a good degree and a good job at the end of it. You're a poor university if you don't give me that. Just look at graduate employment expectations, which have increased significantly over the last 12 months. At the same time, new forms of technology-supported teaching and learning are emerging. MOOCs are being, well, I'll go back to that in a second, were heralded in some quarters as a new alternative to traditional campus-based courses with a unique ability to widen access and engagement. Others question their ability to revolu revolutionise higher education and engage disenfranchised learners and focus instead on more diverse forms of open education policy and practice. I was discussing the impact of MOOCs with some colleagues last week and I heard a very telling statement. MOOCs, so 2011. I wouldn't quite go as far as that because I think they have certainly put open education onto the agenda and the institutions are responding. It'll be interesting to see how practice emerges over the next few years. Other technical innovations to impact on the sector include the re-emergence of affordable virtual reality devices with hardware such as Oculus Rift and Sony have just announced some interesting developments in virtual reality. Looking at the NMC Horizon Scan, and uh, I've, I've put a couple of the statements there from it. The key issues that NMC highlighted um, over the next, uh, well, three different uh, year periods were the flip classroom, learning analytics within a year, three-dimensional printing within two to three years, games and gamification, which seems to move back every year I look at this survey. Um, the quantified self, which was a fairly new one on me. Does anyone here know about the quantified? I'm not, I'm not going to ask Martin because you're a futurist, so you should know about the quantified self. <laughs> it's, it's old hat. It's old hat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Quantified self, so 2013. But um, looking at performance, um, looking at technology that can give us real time data, virtual assistants. Four to five years. Maybe, maybe they're so 2013 as well. So how do universities and colleges address the challenges they face? CSIS has always believed that technology and standards have a crucial... Welcome, Mark Power. Uh, for those that don't know, Mark was um, with CSIS for 10 years, and we're very pleased to see him back. And uh, I did give a thank you to citizens past and present, so uh, welcome, Mark. CTIS has always believed that technology and standards have a crucial role to play in enabling institutions to become more creative, flexible and efficient to meet increasingly diverse demands and to enhance experience. Now it's in its 10th year, the CTIS conference will have an unashamedly te technical focus, what it means to be truly digital in all aspects of education, from assessment to integration, from open education to learning analytics. But what about our students? Are they changing? And I'm not getting into a native, immigrant, resident, visitor, prisoner, which is the newest one I've heard, um, argument. But have they changed? We've talked about digital immigrants. We've done all of that kind of thing in natives. Um, oblige me for a few moments. But who are these digital students? And 2020 seems to be very much in the fore at the moment. Well, how does a 12-year-old think about being a digital student? Now, you're going to have to indulge me with a little bit of paternal gloating here. Um, but my son's 12. And he will be a student, I think, of, well, certainly till he's 18, of one of our institutions post-2020. Um, yes, my son's fortunate or unfortunate enough to come from what you would describe a fairly middle-class background. Um, he's had a life of benefit, pretty much, so I'm not suggesting that he is representational, a representation of this generation, but it is just interesting to get his views on some of what he considers the requirements of a digital institution. I was recently challenged, uh, I, for those that may not know, I. I I have three generations of the family in my, my house. We have my grandmother, who's 86 and knows everything, and um, 
myself, my partner and, and our children. Uh, it's great in some ways that we, 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 we do have that mix uh, and not so great in others. And one of the big issues, as you can probably imagine, as a grandparent she has, is why is he always on that device? He's never off that device. Get him outside. That progressed a little lately to something a, a little stronger. And she said, why doesn't he go and get a proper job like a paper round instead of sitting at that computer? And I thought it was quite significant that, that she said that. JISC has looked at a number of years at what it takes to be a digital student. And so I thought, oh, interesting comment. What about getting a job? Perhaps I should encourage him. Anyway, I didn't think much more about it until recently. I, I looked at my bank statements. And we have a PayPal account. And there were these rather strange amounts being deposited into my bank account. 30 pounds one month, 40 the next, 130 in a few few weeks, uh, a few weeks ago, and I said to my partner, do you know anything about this money? Where, where's this money coming from? What, what's, what's happening? No. I said, well, you're not selling things on eBay or doing... No, 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 okay. Ask my daughter, who's 21. No, no, I only spend you money. I don't create money, which is... She's, she's quite right in that. And I thought, ah, I, I'll have a word with Frankie, who's the 12-year-old I was talking to you about. So... I went down and said, I've got all these little pots of money that are coming into my account. Um, do you know anything about this money? Oh, yeah. Oh, right. He said, well, I, I kind of hacked your PayPal account because I'm not 18 and uh, I need to get some money in and, and that's why it's going there. Well, what are you doing? He said, well, Grandma was giving me grief about a paper round. So he said, ah, I don't really want to do a paper round. Um, so what I do is I develop... Uh, tuition, courses, modules for Minecraft development online. Okay, and he said, I've got a lot of subscribers. Now, I'm going to show you something in a few minutes. And um, Ever the Entrepreneur, it's great digital entrepreneurship skills. They're all here in this video. He's trying to sell you. And if you do wish to subscribe to his channel, that's your, <laughs> that's your choice. But he has any number of subscribers to his digital channel where he produces little modules to teach you how to craft in Minecraft. He's got a reputation. And it asks us a big question about, uh, I know my colleague Mark Johnson is thinking about this at the moment, about education and its role in preparing us, not just for physical networks, and networks as, as we had established, but the virtual networks. Um, and he has a great deal of virtual currency. So he prepares these, and of course, those subscribers to his channel, he now gets um, a, an amount per video downstream of, of advertising on his site, uh, which is giving him a tremendous little income. So, Grandma's nagging, he adapted fairly quickly and developed something as an entrepreneur within the digital world. And this, this student, received a very, very poor grading in his ICT class where he's been taught how to use Microsoft software applications, which says something. Yes, the curriculum's changing. I know we're going to be focusing on coding in the future, but it does say something about the disjunct. So, without further ado, um, I asked him and said, um, after pondering for about an hour and a half what I would talk about for five or ten minutes. What's your problem, Dad? I said, well, I've got to talk about the digital institution. Oh, I'll build you one of those. And an hour and a half later, he came back having constructed a digital institution. Now, I'm not condoning some of the things in here, uh, but they're interesting. Uh, it's interesting to see a 12-year-old's observation of what a digital institution might be. And I'll just play you this film, which is about five minutes. Oh, we won't have his adverts, so he won't get his um, revenue.
like to welcome you to this video. Uh, in this video, we're going to be showing of what I think a uh, digital institution would look like. Um, uh, this is uh, for a, like a school sort of uh, thing. So here it is, um, as you've seen from the sort of panoramic views from the uh, the intro uh, a minute ago. So here it is, and I'll just give you a quick, another quick uh, look at it. So this is the, uh, the uh, actual, this is the uh, surrounding city of it. Uh, so me and my friend built this uh, together. Uh, that's a thing to note, we built it together uh, on this world and uh, yeah, I've even set a waypoint for it, look at me. Uh, so, yeah, we should turn our shaders off. Uh, so this is the um, Digital Learning uh, Enhancement School. All the Dells. So this is the Dells. So we've got, uh, he says he's a baker, this is Roger the Baker. He's uh, now employed here. Uh, but yeah, this is the, um, this is uh, the, uh, the school. So basically, this is a lobby. Uh, it's very, it's very open space. It's, it's not tense. It's not, it's not, you know, it's forceful. It's, uh, you, but you get the idea. There is uh, upstairs to main school, so you get the idea that this is a high rise school, um, and I believe that this is a, this is a way to go um, for, for this. So basically, here is the, uh, here's where you come in. This is the first floor of the, uh, of the hollow areas. So here is just some file storage. And here's some uh, data bank things that teachers can basically register in. This is when the light is uh, on red, lessons are in progress, so people are taking the lessons uh, to there. So this is the hollow hall. Now this is a, uh, a hall of holographic projection, so when you step in a room, here we have uh, Scott the Miner, he is a, a student here, and he is on this area which basically puts a holographic image in their mind of them having a lesson that transfers all the data they need to have that's been set for that um, that lesson. Say you wanted to learn uh, fractions in maths or a particular part of fractions in maths, you would uh, you would uh, put that into the uh, database, which I will. Uh, this is the server host room, so this would uh, also be a uh, yeah, little area, which is nice to uh, host the servers on it. Uh, it has its own server network. Uh, this is the uh, head teacher. Um, and you still got. It doesn't mean that you've got. You still got not got any files. You still have files on a hard copy as well. But you also have them stored on the uh, database. So yeah, that's uh, that's that. And you see, you've got different subjects here with each person in. And um, yeah, these are the. Um, these are what they do. So they each go in. It only shows the last person who went in, but they all go in, and um, and they learn about uh, about that. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, and there are, as I said, all the lesson plans are stored in the databases. Um, so it's uh, yeah, it's quite cool. Uh, now this uh, this is also this school has maximum security, so you're not going to have anyone break in and look at your ring, um, which is very cool. So here is the upper classrooms. So here is um, uh, here is the uh, bit where we go up. So here is. Uh, the restaurant and uh, the, um, uh, the like canteen area. So this is where you'd have all your uh, lovely foods. Um, and it's if you notice, it's not like some of those horrible school ones because no one really likes them. They're all horrible. So you, I've uh, implemented a uh, um, a very nice view uh, from the restaurant to uh, to like here, and you've got some more little cozy bits here. So this is the kitchen as well, store of good food, and this is the actual bar sort of serving area. Um, also, if you go up here, um, this is the uh, robots area, uh, where the robots, and I think the staff, yeah, staff can go here too, um, and this is where they use shell and have their food and stuff. So yeah, we're gonna go up here. That's this is also another way to access this part, where, um, just for to make it easier for the elevator shaft. Um, but up here is um, is uh, some some maintenance area. So as you can hear, there's uh, some electricity everywhere. So yeah, yeah it's uh, pretty pretty dangerous. So I won't do, do stuff. But uh, yeah, uh, it's quite cool. We've got some radars here. We've got some other transmitters. Now I'll have to say all of this. Uh, 
all of this here that you see is powered by solar panels on the top of the roof. There is more built into the actual uh, infrastructure of the building, but th this is what powers everything um, uh, in there. So this is what it looks like from far. But yeah, um, I'd really like to thank you for watching this video. If you have not already subscribed to this YouTube account, uh, feel free to do so. It really, really helps me out a load. Um, I hope you liked, uh, I hope you liked uh, I hope you like what you see. Really, uh, this is uh, this is what uh, I have to have to build. So yeah, uh, goodbye everybody. And yes, if you want to watch the next few videos, or you want to watch a few more videos by me, uh, as I said, subscribe to my YouTube video uh, channels. Or just really check them out. Leave a like. It really helps. Um, and uh, yeah, goodbye. <laughs>